Good evening, everyone. Uh, as you enter the Zoom tonight, please take a look at our upcoming events for JHSM. Thursday, November 4th, we have an interesting program, Detroit Jews, Segregation and the Burwood Wall with Aaron Einhorn. And Wednesday, November 17th, we have a program with Laura Mitchell, Architectural Impact in Detroit. We're very excited for both of those and hope you will register by visiting jhsmichigan.org slash calendar. This evening, we are very fortunate to have with us Rachel Yaskowitz to give a presentation on immigration and resettlement around the world as well as in Michigan. Rachel Yaskowitz served as the Director of Resettlement for Jewish Family Services of Metro Detroit, and in that capacity, successfully resettled many, many Russian Jewish refugee, refugees, as well as Kosovars. Additionally, she moved on to be the founding director of Project Chesed, a provider network that offers pro bono health care to low income medically uninsured members of the Jewish community. Mrs. Yaskowitz is also a member of the faculty of Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine. She is an assistant professor of global health director there and liaison for the school's bi-direction student exchange program with Hadassah Hebrew University School of Medicine. She's a very long and story professional career, both working at the Beaumont School of Medicine, as well as her work in our community with refugees from around the world, and has acted as a liaison with the Chaldean community and helping them with their refugees. I'm going to turn it over to Rachel Yaskowitz now to give her presentation this evening. I just want to remind you all that we will have a question answer session at the end of the presentation. And please submit your questions via the chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we will make sure that they all get answered. I will moderate that after the lecture. And now, Rachel Yaskowitz. Thank you, Kara. Thank you for that generous introduction. I want to share my screen. Let's see if I can do this the right way. Well, I thought I could share my screen. There we go. So let's talk about refugees and resettlement in 2021. Where are we today? I'd like to accomplish several things this evening. First, I'd like to talk. Your screen isn't sharing. I apologize. You'll have to try that again. OK, let's see how we can do this. It says you've disabled my screen sharing. Nope, we can see it all now. Great, okay. So let's go back to the beginning. We're talking about refugees and resettlement in 2021. And when you become a refugee, it's not easy. You were starting as this family is a very long journey without knowing where or when it will end. I would like to disclose to the evening that I try to be respectful of all people and all genders and religions in this presentation without presenting a specific political point of view. All data are the most recent available and the photos are in the public domain so they do not violate confidentiality. To the extent possible, voters are for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. I'd like to accomplish several things tonight. We're going to start talking about the magnitude of the problem. Then we'll talk a little bit about the vocabulary of refugees. And we will go on to talk about the refugee experience. As you see in the first slide and again in this slide, families leaving Iraq. What is the magnitude of the problem? In 2020, there was forced displacement around the globe of 82 million 
400,000 people. That's a staggering number. What would you do with 82.4 million people? That's more than the population of France with the 65 and a half million. It's more than the population of Thailand with the 69 million. How would you shelter, feed, clothe, and provide care for this number of people? And of that magnitude, only 26.4 are designated refugees by the UN. And we'll talk about that. 48 million are internally displaced. That means they have never crossed an international border. They are still in their native country. Maybe they went from Damascus to Aleppo or vice versa. Now in 2011, there were 800,000 refugees around the world. That was the highest number in a century. Just five years later, that number had expanded to 21 million refugees, exceeding all previous records. And in 2020, look where we were, 26.4 million refugees. Where will we be in 2025? That means that at the current rate, one in every 95 people is displaced, forced to flee every single day. And if you look at this picture and subsequent pictures, I want you to observe very carefully. Look at the people, look how they're dressed. It tells you what season it is. It also tells you, notice how clean they are. They're well dressed, okay? Also, notice what they're carrying with them. Are they prepared for a long journey? Look at the terrain. This is rocky desert. This group of Iraqi Christians is leaving Iraq, heading towards Jordan. The distance from Baghdad to Amman is 998 kilometers. That's approximately 500 miles. How long is it going to take this group to walk across the desert to Jordan? And what will they eat? This is some food for the journey. Where will they sleep? I can answer that. They're gonna sleep on the ground. So keep this in mind as we look at the slides. What countries today are generating the most refugees? Syria. There are 6.7 million people from Syria designated refugees. Another seven point some million are displaced internally. Venezuela has generated 4 million. Afghanistan, 2.6 million. And you may be surprised to see these data from South Sudan and Myanmar, which are also among the top countries generating refugees. 71% of all refugees are hosted in neighboring countries. And 50% of all people are under the age of 18. Let's talk a little bit about the vocabulary of this problem. An immigrant, as we all know, is a person who migrates to another country, usually for permanent residence. An immigrant is an umbrella term. And under that umbrella, you have various other terms. For example, a migrant. This is a person who is not in any imminent danger. It's a person who chooses to move away for opportunities, usually work or better living conditions. And many migrants go back and forth seasonally. Another category is an asylee, a person who is seeking asylum. Now in the United States to seek asylum, a person must already be present and ask for protection based on persecution or a well-founded fear of persecution should he or she return to her country of nationality. What usually happens is an individual enters the United States, maybe on a visitor's visa, and at immigration, asks the immigration officer for political asylum. That person is then taken to a detention center, processed, and has to appear before a federal immigration judge before officially released. 
Now, perhaps they have family in the United States, in which case they'll be released to the family. Here in Michigan, we are way behind on asylum applications, and it can take as long as two years till a person's case appears before a judge. Another category is a humanitarian parolee. This is someone admitted to the United States for humanitarian reasons. Perhaps it is for health care. Perhaps they have relatives here and they have petitioned and the individual is admitted for health care. But they have no designated immigration status. The individual is on parole to the Secretary of State for up to two years. And during that period, they must go through an extended process to adjust their status to remain in the United States. Now, humanitarian parole is currently being granted to many Afghans leaving their native country, but in need of rapid evacuation and relocation. It's a quick way of getting people here, but it's not a permanent solution. Another category that we've all been reading about lately is the SIV, Special Immigration Visa. This is specific for Afghan and Iraqi nationals who worked as interpreters and translators for our military overseas. And the Defense Authorization Act, which introduced this category, allows up to 50 SIVs annually. In order to qualify, an individual must meet specific criteria. Now these criteria are not public. I'd be happy to share them with you, but they're not available. Then we come to the category that we're discussing tonight, refugees. Refugees are a specific legal definition, first defined by the United Nations and accepted by the signatories to the United Nations agreements. The same definition is codified by the United States and the US Immigration and Naturalization Act. And as you read the definition, notice the key operational words, Refugees are people living outside of their country of origin who are unwilling or unable to return to their country of nationality because of persecution or a well-founded fear of persecution on the basis of race, religion, nationality, or membership in a particular social group. Operationally, you must be outside of your country you must cross an international border in order to seek protection as a refugee. Further, you must be able to document persecution. You have been pushed to leave your country. Persecution is defined as a serious human rights violation, such as torture and this picture of the people chained together is a mild photo where I teaching this to medical school at Oakland University, William Beaumont. And you see, I, do, I did teach this there for nine years. The pictures I would show you would be much more graphic. But these people are handcuffed together. You see a woman's hand and a man's hand. The chain is anchored to the floor. So it is a means of humiliating people to bring them to subjugation. You can't move very far. How do you eat? How do you toilet yourself, et cetera, et cetera, when you are chained together to another human being? So you have to be able to prove torture. Perhaps you can document with the UN that someone in your family or your neighbors or your group was murdered because of their belonging of, to that group, because of who they were. Were you imprisoned? Were your relatives imprisoned? How about your neighbors? You have to document that. Prohibited lifestyle. This is specifically homosexuality. Homosexuality is illegal in 70 countries in this world. And it is punishable with everything from flogging to imprisonment. In addition, five countries, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Sudan and Mauritania all have the death penalty for homosexuality. Deprivation of livelihood speaks for itself. Prohibition of religious practice. 
tremendous persecution of the Yazidis in Iraq, their Astrozoarians. They were heavily persecuted by ISIS. We all saw those situations unfolding. Today, the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar are persecuted. So this is another reason that people seek status. Now, technically, all refugees are immigrants, but based on the definition I shared with you, all immigrants are not refugees. And this is a group of Yazidis leaving Iraq. You can see the smoke in the background. Refugees are displaced people who are forced to emigrate to survive. This is a group of Kosovars leaving during the war there. Now compare the groups. In the first slide of the Yazidis, you saw women and children. Here, you see all ages, genders. You see it's winter time. You also see they're walking along the rail tracks. It's a lot easier than walking on desert because the trains aren't running. Here, you see another group. These women and children are leaving Syria, are leaving, I'm sorry, are leaving Europe during World War II, heading to Syria. This group is leaving Syria last year, heading to Europe. Again, look at the people in the group. You see mainly women and children. You see how they're dressed, which tells you the season. You see they're not carrying very much with them, but pay attention to the terrain that they're walking across. How far will they get in their journey from Syria through Turkey to Europe? It's not an easy journey. Most of the Syrians were trying to get to Germany some wanted to get to Scandinavia. Some have remained in Turkey. Also, a small number, I don't know, a small number have chosen to go to Greece or into European countries and have jumped into the waters to do so. Again, it's winter time. You can tell by the way they're dressed. You see the shoes on their shoulders. You know they're barefooted. What's in this water? Is it rocky, parasites, other creatures? And when they get out, notice they're wearing jeans. I think we all know what wet jeans feel like. And coming out of this in the winter and continuing to walk across Europe is a real challenge. Some people choose to go across the Mediterranean to get to Greece or Italy. And here you see rescue teams leading the boats and helping them get to land into a refugee camp. There's another group in the water seeking safety. These are Rohingya. They are Muslims, the persecuted minority in Myanmar, leaving the Rakhine state, trying to get to Bangladesh. There are over a million Rohingya refugees under UN protection. 4.2 million Rohingyas are stateless. They are persecuted, the men have been killed, the women have been tortured and raped, their villages have been burned. And when they cross the river, this is how they try to get out, to get to a UN camp in Bangladesh. You see here, we've all seen these pictures of Afghans leaving Kabul. And where are they all going? to get to a UN High Commissioner for Refugee Asylum Center. And once they get there, they ask to re receive refugee status. Now, you aren't automatically a refugee just because you leave your country and cross an international border. You must be designated a refugee and only the UN is authorized to give that status. It is determined by face-to-face -face interviews, and they've really been slowed down by COVID, by UN staff, wherever the refugee takes sanctuary. It may be in a city in Europe at a refugee center, or it may be at a camp in Greece, in Italy, in the desert. It may be anywhere, but UN has designated camps. 
and you will be asked specific questions to prove your identity, to prove your history, and if you warrant refugee status by documenting your persecution and your need to flee, you will be given the UN refugee card. It's not easy. Refugees are a highly traumatized population. I showed you a few mild pictures of refugees on their road, but they've been persecuted, they've taken flight, they're in migration, and they're waiting resettlement. What is it like? Well, if my tech skills enable me, let's listen to this directly from Neil Gaiman. Sorry. Unfortunately, I don't think the sound is coming through, but if you send me the clip, I can send it out to our viewers when uh, I, I email them tomorrow. Fine, thank you, I apologize. My tech skills aren't my strong suit. He was describing the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan, where so many of the Syrians are living and where they have established a village with little pathways, they are selling wares there. They are trying to grow gardens. They are living in tents, sleeping on mattresses on the ground, but they do not want to be resettled. They are waiting there, hoping to go home. This is another camp. This is Kakuma refugee camp in Africa. It is in Kenya. Kakuma used to be the largest refugee camp in the world. It is was established 35 years ago for the lost boys of Sudan. Now, some of those lost boys have been resettled in the United States and Canada, but many of the lost boys are still in Kakuma. They have been there for 35 years. They've married in Kakuma. They've had children in Kakuma. They are still living there, another generation. You see these children, in a refugee camp. You see the water. They're filling up the pitcher to take water to their families to drink. You notice it's not what we would drink. You see these schoolgirls. These girls are going to school in Kakuma. They were born there. They have never known any other place their entire lives. Now, why is that? The Kenyan government does not want them as citizens and they cannot go home again. Therefore, they are stateless. They would like to remain in Africa, but there is no place that will take them. So they remain in Kakuma where they have been living. This is a refugee camp in Cox's Bazaar area of Bangladesh. This is now the largest refugee area in the world. The Rohingya who were there, a million, live in horrible conditions, as you can see. And this is an area where there are monsoon rains. You can imagine what happens to this land when the monsoons come and to these shelters. The Bangladesh government does not want people living there. So they have identified an uninhabited island in the Bay of Bengal, 21 miles from the nearest land mass. Actually, you could question whether it's truly an island. It was submerged until four years ago. It is believed to be an atoll in the Bay of Bengal. 
and they have started relocating Rohingya to this island in the Bay of Bengal. The UN and humanitarian groups have asked for access and it has been denied. So no one is quite sure what the circumstances there are. Here you see a group of Afghans arriving in, in housing in Qatar, in Doha. And the actual housing they will be staying in was built as guest houses. Now, light and migration, as you can imagine, impacts the health of the individual and it really exacerbates pre-existing conditions. Think about the physical environment, social environment, health behavior, and how do you cope with the situation and think of the socioeconomic situation. Look at the physical environment. It's winter time, it can snow in the Middle East. And you see what happens when you're living in tents. Think about the environment, women trying to get blankets and carpets for their tent. This is a family on a Greek island. They have just taken this child to the health clinic on the island and are now heading back to their shelter. You see the wind, you can feel, you can see the wind blowing their survival blanket. Here is a camp in Africa. Again, we see the rancid water. Think of the issues of sanitation. Where are their toilet facilities? And then you think about the social environment. You see two different UN shelters. You see the land, you see the tents, and you see families in the doorway. It's not conducive to social development or contact. This is a UN health clinic in Jordan. It is run by volunteer doctors. Now that too is another issue because wherever there is a health clinic, it is run by volunteer doctors from the, the country that is hosting the camp. And there is a great deal of suspicion among the refugees, distrust with the, the people who are taking care of them from the local country. They distrust them. Will they take care of them? Are they from the right tribe? Are they hostile to their religion? How safe is it to go to the clinic? So healthcare is a huge issue. Here you see a hospital in Kenya in a refugee camp. Notice the crowding, notice the makeshift equipment. Now, not all refugees live in camps. There are some people seeking refugee protection who may have had the means to get to a country and go to an apartment or who may have relatives and friends in a country and they are sheltering in place with them until they can find a permanent solution. And as you recall, I said people like to stay in a neighboring area where they are most comfortable. So you see Turkey, Colombia for Venezuelans, Pakistan for Afghanis, because Afghanistan and Pakistan share a 1600 mile long border that is very, very porous. It's easy to cross over into Pakistan. You go across the mountains, you go through the forest, relatively easy. Uganda is hosting refugees. Germany is a very, very favorable location for, for refugees. They are treated fairly well there. Now, once people are designated refugees, the process to be resettled is very, very long and complex. And I will address the process to be resettled in the United States, because that's where we are, that's what we're most interested in. At a minimum, it takes two years. That means you will be living in a camp or in temporary housing in a host country for at least two years. And if you were coming from Syria or another country where there is an active war and total chaos, it may take three years. Once the UN High Commissioner for Refugees designates you refugee status, they will refer you to the United States Refugee Admission Program for Resettlement. You have to be the right match. That means 
Do you have relatives in the United States? What is your knowledge of the West? Do you have friends here? Could you make it here? So if they feel you can succeed here or have relatives here for family reunification, you will be assigned to the US. You do not have a choice. Refugees cannot ask to go to a country. It is not always honored. And you will see refugees, some will be assigned to the United States. A sibling may be sent to Germany. Another sibling may be sent to Australia. So family units that have lived in compounds in their native land are broken up. State Department manages all overseas applications and processing in collaboration with Homeland Security, the FBI, the Department of Defense. Refugees are heavily vetted. First, they have an overseas interview conducted on site. Initially, and that's all slowed down because of COVID, but by US examiners. And they ask them very in-depth questions because it is known that along the route of migration, people are kidnapped, people are lost, people die, and other people may take their identity. We know women are kidnapped and children are left without a parent. People take another family's children and bring them along with them. So everything has to be very carefully examined. Are these children with you really yours? If they are not, what is your intention? Are you honorable? Will you be their guardian? Are you taking them to relatives? Or do you intend to traffic them? Are you involved in any criminal activity? Afghanistan is a major opium producing country. and There was a huge criminal enterprise with opium. Is this individual trying to get to the United States in order to involve himself or herself in criminal activity with the opium trade? The interviews are in depth and intense. Biometrics are reviewed, facial recognition, iris recognition, fingerprints, cell phones and cell phone records are carefully examined. And it isn't only the United States that examine cell phones, the Jordanians search cell phones for all the Syrians who come in. And if they find that Syrians have been in contact with anyone in Syria who was on the Jordanian watch list, that Syrian will be deported back to Syria. Now that is true. It is illegal against international law to deport an individual back to a home country where they will be persecuted. But it's practiced. Also databases and watch lists will be examined to see if this person is on a danger list. Towards the end of all this vetting, if the person has passed all these previous reviews, they will be screened, medical screening and immunization records. You have to be very careful here. Why medical screening? First of all, TB is making a major comeback globally. So people are examined for TB. If they are found to be TB positive, they will be started on treatment until the tuberculosis is under control enough for them to be considered for resettlement. How about immunizations? We know that Afghanistan and Pakistan are two of the countries that have the lowest immunization rates in the world. There was some measles brought to Ramstad Air Base. Some children came to Ramstad with the Afghan evacuation and they had measles. We also know that Pakistan and Afghanistan are the last two countries in the world where polio, polio exists. There were about 130 some cases of polio in those two countries last year. Medical screening and immunizations are very important. If a person passes this 14 step vetting process and is deemed appropriate for resettlement in the United States, they will be referred to the International Organization of Migration, processes all of their travel documents, arranges their flight and generates a loan. Yes, every refugee coming to the United States finds a loan agreement with the International Organization of Migration. And they agree starting six months after resettlement 
they will begin to pay back the loans. A round ticket, round, a one-way ticket from Afghanistan is anywhere from $800 to $1,500, depending on the time of year. And most Afghan families are families of six. So you can do the math. So people from Afghanistan who arrive here are already in debt to the international organization. Once they get to the United States, the Office of Refugee Resettlement in the Department of Health and Human Service is responsible for overseeing the program. And they work with local agencies in resettlement. How many refugees did the United States resettle in the last few years? You know, we hear so much about it, but people think the program, that the country is being overrun by refugees. In 2018, we resettled 78,900 refugees. There was a cap on refugee admissions of 80,000. In 2019, the cap was 30,000. We resettled about 22,000. In 2020, the cap was 18,000. We resettled under 15,000. In 2021, the fiscal year just ended September 30th. The United States resettled 11,421 refugees, of whom 495 were from Afghanistan. And what are we expecting to resettle in 2022? It is anticipated that the United States will accept 125,000 refugees. Now think about it. How do we go from 11,000 to 125,000? The system is set up with the presidential determination. Each year, the president of the United States sends Congress a recommendation called his determination, the number of refugees to be admitted. And this is outside of any other immigration numbers. So the president recommended 125,000 refugees in the current fiscal year. Congress accepted that number. And then there is a request in front of Congress to authorize funding to resettle 90,000 Afghans. There are already 64,000 Afghans present in the United States. Where are they living? They're living on army bases, such as this base at Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. Now, you notice this is a big improvement over the other refugee camps we've looked at. So Afghans are here at Fort McCoy. They will be here indefinitely because they came here with humanitarian emergency evacuation. They have not been vetted. They have not had health screenings or gone through any of the processes. They will be here at Fort McCoy for a long time, maybe two years, Maybe it can be expedited. That remains to be seen. But how can you expedite the in-depth process? In the meantime, people will be going to English classes. They will be going to acculturation classes and the children will be in school. What happens next? The United States government contracts with nine faith-based relief and rescue organizations to manage resettlement in the United States. And some of these organizations have people on the ground around the world. Here in the Jewish community, we have always worked with HIAS, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, and we will continue to work with HIAS to resettle. HIAS is on the ground. In Michigan, the resettlement agencies are Bethany Christian Services in Grand Rapids, Catholic Social Services. Now, Catholic Social Services has a long history of resettlement. However, because of the minimization of the refugee admissions, one third of all the United States refugee resettlement programs either put their programs on hold, suspended, or eliminated refugee resettlement. Now, Catholic Social Services in Michigan is asked to be recertified so the Catholic Social Services in Detroit will be resettling. In the meantime, 
through which Family Services of Washtenaw County in Ann Arbor has been doing an amazing job. They accepted some Afghans last year. They have already accepted some Afghans this year, and they will go forward with this work. The Meritas, formerly Lutheran Social Services, is resettling Afghans. Where did the refugees live who come to the United States? Well, these were the top 10 states accepting refugees in 2018, and it hasn't changed. Texas, Washington State, Ohio, and California, and New York are the top. They're always vying. Maybe it's flip flop twos and first, but these are the country, this is the states, I'm sorry, accepting refugees. And I would imagine they will continue to be the top resettlement states. Here in Michigan, we used to be the fourth highest refugee recipients. However, that's no longer true. We're not even in the top 10. Here you see the data. And in 2022, Michigan anticipates accepting 1,300 refugees from Afghanistan. Where will they go? Samaritas agreed to accept some. Jewish Family Services of Washtenaw has agreed to accept some. And of course, Bethany Christian Services. We do not know how the pie will be divided. Once the refugees arrive in a local community, their resettlement is mandated by the federal government. First, there must be reception. That means someone greets them at the airport and the welcoming team must be linguistically and culturally competent. How many people do you think speak Dari or Pashto? the languages of Afghanistan. In the days of Russian resettlement, it was easier to find volunteers who spoke Russian, Yiddish. That was 50 years ago. The first Russian Jewish refugees came to Detroit in 1971. So much has changed. In 1971, the UN wasn't on the ground. Russian refugees went to Vienna or to Rome they were there briefly, and then they came directly to America. That's not the case. People are in limbo for two or three years. And when they get here, it is not easy for them. But we have to have linguistically appropriate people to meet them. We're required to provide clean, secure, well-maintained housing, appropriate for the size, ages, and physical limitations of the family being resettled. That means no two bedroom apartments for families at six. We need a minimum of three bedrooms. It's hard to take people into your home. We need housing, furniture, all the bedding must be new. That's a health law. There's a global problem with bed bugs. Mattresses must be new, pillows must be new. You, new. And the food that they find in the housing they come to should be culturally appropriate. It would be a little hard for people coming from Afghanistan or from a UN refugee camp to start with mac and cheese. We're required to provide escorted transportation for refugees once they arrive. They need transportation for case management, for their health screening. Again, they'll have a complete screening within 30 days of arriving here. And then they'll have follow-up medical appointments. They need someone to go with them to social security they are here is a legal residence. They need to apply for social security. They'll have to go to English language classes. And of course, mandatory case management, which is the core service. How are we gonna find case managers who speak Dari or Pashto? How are we gonna find case managers and drivers when the infrastructure has been dismantled? This is a huge challenge. And of course, everyone must be culturally sensitive and linguistically appropriate to help the refugees start their life, to educate them to life in the community. Refugees are entitled to four months of food stamps and eight months of refugee medical assistance. It's a short-term program, considered a short-term Medicaid program for refugees. It depends on every state as to how expansive this program is. 
refugees get financial support it's called refugee cash assistance for 120 days at the end of which they are expected to be self-sufficient. That's a tall order. And that cash assistance is $1,225 for the four months for each adult. Now, if you're a couple, $2,450 for four months. If you're single, it's $1,225 for four months. If you're a family of six, it's approximately $6,000 a month because the amount for each child is less than 1225. That supplement covers your rent, your utilities, your food, and all other necessities for 120 days. The Refugee Resettlement Program also provides vocational assistance. Everyone is assessed for employability and helped find a job because you have to be self-sufficient in 120 days. You must go to ESL classes and you get interpreters. As you can imagine, the settlement is fraught with challenges, the least of which is language and communication. Think about the knowledge gaps. What do people know about life in our country? It is so stressful going from one of the camps you saw to living in a rental house in Troy or Sterling Heights where some of the Sudanese refugees are placed in rehab houses in Detroit. Last year, most of the refugees coming were from the Democratic Republic of Congo, placed in Detroit. Albanians were placed in Sterling Heights in Troy. Think of the noise, think of the traffic. Think of going to the grocery store, it's extremely stressful, coupled with having to be self-sufficient in four months. Then think about our healthcare system. I think most of us struggle with understanding health insurance at some point. How would you explain health insurance and making an appointment to refugees who have health issues that need to be tended to? It's true their challenge is they are limitedly English proficient and even if they're required to go to English for six months, feel inadequate for their employment and money management and understanding all they have to do. There is a huge need for competent interpreters to be present with them at all times. Not a relative, but a professional interpreter who speaks the same dialect, who is culturally competent, who understands when you tell a woman that that lump in her breast is only an infection and the doctor wants to drain it to see what it is so he can treat it. You don't say tumor. It's not culturally appropriate. It must be tribally acceptable. You don't want a Tutsi translating for a Hutu. And particularly with Afghans, this will be an even bigger issue. And the person is preferably of the same gender. Now, we want to reach out. We want to be helpful. But how do you do it when you know there are people with physical and mental health issues? Well. All of us want to show empathy. We want to show that we have some knowledge of the trauma and their experience. And it's best to say that, I know you've had a hard time. Can you tell me your story? Listen, they will tell you selectively. I've met with many Chaldeans and heard their stories. And each time I learn new information as the story unfolds. Ask them, why did you come to America? Perhaps they have family here, or perhaps they were sent here when they really wanted to go to Australia. How is it here for you? And what do you do every day? And if they tell you, I'm afraid to go out of the house because if I get lost, I don't speak to English, I don't know how I'll get home, or I just sit home all day, then you know you need to tell the case manager. Yes, there are people who come here and depressed. There's a natural depression of being here, secondary to loss of their homeland. They may have lost loved ones, either through separation or through death, friends. They know they will never return to the graves of their ancestors, culturally extremely important. They have left all their life's possessions and their lifestyle behind. And to compound that, everything here is so strange. Customs, 
they're unemployed, and they can't even speak the language properly. So it's normal for people to feel confused, anxious, a little disoriented to where they are. There's a certain euphoria, the relief of not hearing guns, not having planes overhead, but there's a tremendous longing for home. Sometimes people develop PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And you see this particularly in women. Women have always been used as tools of war, rape, torture, that tremendous trauma going through starvation, seeing a lot of death around them, and they may not have their husbands or brothers around them. We know there are more women survivors than men. They will have nightmares and flashbacks. Perhaps you see them withdraw or tremendously distrustful when you approach them based on their experience. Refugees are very resilient people. Remember that. They are not all alike. They come from different cultures and experiences. They have different expectations and needs. We have to remember, we can't treat them as a group. We have to treat them as individuals. We may see symptoms of mental health issues, but that doesn't mean they're mentally ill or they need treatment. They need support. They need empathy. We have to also acknowledge that women have faced particularly difficult circumstances. And we also need to remember, any of us had only one hour to escape from our home, to run for our lives. Where would we go? How would we get there? And what would we take with us? Ponder that. And if you would like to be of help to refugees coming to our community, when you see the webinar or you watch the repeat of this, here's some information for you going forward, three sources for you to help in the situation. So again, with my great technical prowess, I'm having. So I think I'll end there and leave about 10 minutes for questions. And I know the material is very heavy. It's a very heavy subject. It would be nice to be able to deal with something light and upbeat in these difficult times. But this is a difficult subject. And all of us need empathy to address this humanitarian issue it has been politicized, but I hope we'll think of it from the humanitarian point of view. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them via the chat feature. I am monitoring that as we speak and um, Rachel Yasquist will answer any questions you have uh, anything you want a little bit more, more information on, anything you'd like her to go more in depth on, please feel free to submit those questions now. It's a lot to absorb. Yeah. It's hard to know what to ask. It's a lot to digest. Yes, it, it's it's a lot to digest, digest, but a lot of important, uh, very pertinent, very interesting information. Are you okay if um, if any of our viewers would like to email you at a later date? Maybe if they come up with questions on a repeat viewing, or if uh, they walk away after tonight and have any further questions, may I give out your email when I I send the link of this recording to um, to our, our attendees tomorrow. I think that'll work fine. Whatever okay. works, whatever your usual process is, is fine. Great, then that's what we'll do. We'll give everyone a chance um, since from, I'm not seeing any questions and I know this is a lot of really uh, intense material. We will give everyone a, tan a chance to digest and I will be sure to send out your email to those who are viewing this so that if they have any questions, oh, we just had a question come through. 
you mentioned it was against the law to send people back to their country of persecution. So we did that. What country are you specifically talking to about? Because there's a French term, refoulement, which means backing up of water in a pipe. And that's the international law. Um, the Jordanians do it. We should not be sending people back to the country of persecution. Now, there is a caveat there in the United States. If a person is here and has broken a law, for example, if someone is here to seek political asylum, and this does happen, the children are going to school and they learn that it's not okay for the parents to hit each other and they teach them what to do. And they may be in a situation where the parents in an argument, dad hits mom and the kids call the police. Well, that's not acceptable for someone who is here on parole or who is seeking asylum, who does not have permanent status. And a case may be opened and deportation proceedings may begin. So there are various situations where yes, people are returned to the country. It is extremely problematic. It is still against international law. Some Iraqis from Michigan have been returned to Iraq. Any other questions from anyone in our audience? All right, well, if there are no more questions, we will provide your email address to those who are viewing in case they have any questions at a later time. Rachel, thank you so much. This was a really wonderful, wonderful presentation. So in depth, so full of knowledge, so uh, so full of information that I had not, not known before. And we really appreciate you sharing this with us tonight. Thank, thank you, to you for everybody. having me. Thank, thank you. you for watching. Thank you to everybody who attended. Thank you to everybody who's watching right now. We really, really appreciate it. And we hope to see you on one of our Zoom programs again very soon. Good night, everyone. Good night.